The question here is, could you give us an overview to settlement of foodings? Alright, let's start with the introduction. Supposing, say, I have a shallow footing that supports the column load of P. This footing is going to experience a settlement S. S basically comes from the compressibility of the soil layers below the footing up until the bedrock. So in this example, we have a thin layer of clay 1, the whole of clay 2, and then the sand layer, right? All of these are going to contribute to S. There are three types of settlements. SI, the immediate settlement. SE, the consolidation settlement. And S of S, the secondary consolidation or creep consolidation settlement. Every material experiences an elastic settlement, and this usually happens instantaneously. That's why it's called the immediate settlement. So there's going to be a little bit of elastic settlement associated with this layer, this layer, and this layer. The immediate settlement is beyond the scope of this course, and if you are interested, I'll refer you to the book, which has a fairly good treatment of this. The second component, called the consolidation settlement, and this component is a time-dependent uh, settlement. It doesn't happen right away. It takes several years uh, before it ceases. And this is the main focus in this course. So we're going to be talking about this in, uh, in, in detail. The consolidation settlement is negligible in sand, but it's very significant in clays. The final component is the secondary consolidation, or the creep consolidation settlement. This again is a time-dependent settlement. It doesn't happen right away. It happens little by little. It usually takes a lot longer to um, come to an end uh, than the consolidation settlement. And it happens both in sands and clays, but it's a lot more significant in clays. Again, this is beyond the scope of this course, and if you are interested, I'll refer you to the book, which again has a uh, fairly good um, treatment of this. Let's say we have a building supported by two shallow footings like shown in this picture. Let's also say for whatever reasons the settlement of these footings are not the same. One experiences settlement of S1, the other one experiences a settlement of S2. This leads to what we call the differential settlement. And this differential settlement is usually a lot more dangerous than just the settlement or uniform settlement of the building itself. You may recall from your structural analysis that this type of differential settlement may produce very large bending moments of shear forces on the beams connecting the two foundations. And if these bending moments and shear forces are too much, the beams could collapse and therefore the structure may experience a total collapse or at least it could sink or tilt. And therefore, it is of interest to keep the differential settlement within acceptable limits. Here's a world-famous example where the uh, differential settlement has played a role. In fact, you could say the differential settlement is the one that has brought so much prominence for the leaning tower of Pisa. Here is a little bit of details about the soil underneath the uh, footing supporting the Leaning Tower of Pisa. The investigations over the years apparently had uh, revealed that the cause of the uh, tilting is kind of complicated, but definitely the consolidation settlement has played a, an important role. Another interesting example has to do with the settlement issues involved with the Kansai International Airport, which is located in Osaka, Japan, very close to Kobe, where you might recall there was a huge earthquake in 1995. Luckily, the airport didn't suffer too much damage. Anyway, the airport opened in 1995, and I had the privilege to visit this airport as part of a earthquake reconnaissance team and learn a little bit about the settlement problem they were dealing with. The column supporting this airport, and there were a large number of them, were expected to uh, settle 
38 teeth over a period of 50 years. But apparently, all of it or much of it happened by 2000. 38 feet. That's a lot, right? Why was it going to settle 38 feet? Well, the airport was built offshore, about five miles from the coast, and the seabed in this area consists of um, highly compressible clay. So the uh, normal settlement calculations indicated that the columns were going to sub settle by about 38 feet. So they knew that before they built the airport, but they still went ahead and built it. The interesting part of the story is how they are handling it, or how they were handling it. If you go down to the basement of this airport, you can see all the columns that are supporting the airport. These columns, as well as the beams, are fully instrumented. There are all kinds of instrumentation. And the sensor readings are coming into a control room. And there's always somebody sitting in front of the computer monitoring the sensor readings. When the computer flags that the difference in settlement between columns or two columns has exceeded the limit, then they know it's time to take the action. What kind of action? Well, this is what they do. There's a truck running around in the basement with the hydraulic jack. They will drive the truck to the column that is settling too much and lift it up and insert steel plates to support it. If I recall, the each uh, steel plate has a thickness of about an inch, and you insert as many steel plates as necessary in order to support the column. Now you have brought the difference of settlement between these columns uh, within acceptable limits. Now you keep doing that uh, based on the sensor reading. And this is how they are handling it. 